Hey guys, I just want to say that uh, in the first service, uh, the illustrious associate pastor Cliff said, well, we have our good friend Rabbi Greg Hirschberg, and I think he's been here six years. And Chuck said, seven. He goes, seven? Hmm. He said, like, hmm, like, can't we find anybody better? <laughs> um, and also when I, uh, I have to, you know, leave a synagogue real quick to get, you know, Atlanta traffic, it's, it's rated uh, the worst traffic in the United States of America now, worse than New York and worse than L.A., and they have four spots that are in the top 100 worst thoroughfares in the United States of America. So you get on 75 from Macon and try to get to the airport, it could take you three, four hours if there's traffic, and Saturday there's a lot of traffic, so I rush to get there, and I just finished service, and I land in Memphis, and I get into the bathroom, and I don't know if you've ever seen these guys, but they seem to be very sweet, but they seem to be in their own world, like they're the only ones that exist. And there was one towel dispenser in the bathroom, and he's just like, ah, da, da. you know, he grabs a towel, he's standing in front of it, grabs another towel sitting in front of it, and by the third towel, I'm telling you, I was this close to going, well, I was this close to grabbing him by the back of the neck, to be honest with you, but <laughs> I kind of didn't want to say that, but we're in a church, so I should be honest. So I wanted to say, for the love of God and everything holy, can you move aside? I'm in a rush. And if he would have said, what's the big rush? I would have had to say, I'm, I'm meeting a pastor. I'm going to be preaching about no greater love. <laughs> and probably wouldn't have been a good witness, right? Well, um, I got to tell you, um, I'm really excited about tonight because uh, what, what I'm going to be using, basically, is just Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I'm not going to do all the verses, but I just want you to know there's 80 verses, there's 31,102 verses, so it's, it's less than two-tenths of one percent of the Bible. But I'm here to tell you that I believe you could see God's incredible plan of redemption right in the first three chapters. I mean, you don't even have to go further, seriously. And, and Genesis 3 is, is the capstone. We're going to do that Monday night. It's going to, I'm, and I'm not selling. I have no vested interest, right? I'm here doesn't matter if nobody shows or everybody shows it it's not going to change anything right I, i'm just here to tell you that i really think they're all interdependent and they really build and i it's two hours i'd love for you to try to make it your business to come i mean if you can if you can get away from social media for a few minutes and uh, i i really think it's important listen i used beth yeshua as a a lab and i used the the congregants of beth yeshua as guinea pigs and, and I did the same thing because I wanted to test it, you know. And I have to tell you, um, I found out, I didn't realize how few people are convinced that God legitimately loves them. Not biblically. Everybody knows that, right? For God so loved the world. I mean, we memorize the scriptures. Um, and every now and then we, we believe them, right? But I think, it's, it's, I think it's the biggest problem in the body. People will tell you the biggest problem in the body is, is that people don't forgive. They don't forgive because they don't love. And if they don't feel forgiven, they don't feel loved. And if they don't love, how can they love anybody else and forgive anybody else? It's some sick, twisted, uh, insidious, demonic thing that it's like, well, if I don't feel forgiven and loved, then, then why should I let you feel that way? How, how dare you have the right to feel that way? And if you don't have it, you can't give it because there's no way you can give what you don't have. If you were broke and I asked you for a million dollars, you might want to give it, but it's impossible. And how can you take somebody to a place that you've never been yourself? And it's not malicious. There's some beautiful people that do love the Lord. They just can't buy it. And the only reason I'm sharing this is because, you know, I met the Lord in Israel in 89. It's been almost 20, 29 years now that the Lord and I have been operating daily. And, and some days are good, some days are not. Some days you would think that you were talking to Jesus, and some days is he's nowhere to be found in my tabernacle. But nevertheless, I haven't strayed. I haven't gone back in the world. I've never looked back. But in all this time, I've never been really convinced of God's love. I'm just sorry to say that. It's almost like I'm ashamed to say that. Um, I, just, I just felt like it's too big of a price. I can't accept it. Of course, I'm not worthy. Nobody is, but... So I'll, 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 I'll prove it, not in an ugly way, I'll but I will witness to everybody, I will go to every country there is, I will, I will develop crazy prison ministry. We're sending, you know what we're doing? And it's a ministry, actually, a Baptist ministry that I'm working with out of Morristown, Tennessee. It's called Harvest of Israel. We're sending 200 custom-made wheelchairs to Israel. 
Um, these are wheelchairs for kids like that are frozen. These are kids that have never seen the outside. And they're not just Jewish kids. They're Arabs, they're Christians, um, they're Palestinians in Bethlehem, and they're $5,000 a chair, but I found a ministry in Iowa that will make them for 500 bucks cost. This, this ministry makes not a penny. Then Harvest of Israel, my Baptist friends, are going to ship them to Israel. Then we had to pay for them 100 grand, and we got that overnight. And then I'm going to go to Israel next month and meet all the kids and present the wheelchairs to them. In fact, Christian Broadcasting Network is going to be there. So I keep doing these things. Why? Because I love the Lord and I love the kids. But part of me is like, I, I need to prove myself. You ever feel like that? You're just like, nah, I'm just not doing enough. So, so what do people tell you? Just come to church more and read your Bible more and pray more. How much more? How much is enough? When is enough enough? What's the cutoff? So I, I Chuck talked to me about this conference. I got very excited about it. And uh, so here I am. So, so if you could, I would, I would try to make it my business because I'm telling you for the people that watch online and for the people, a lot of them told me it was a game changer. For the first, I'm talking about some women that have been in the Lord for over 60 years. Some widows that said, I believe it now and I'm free. So I'm gonna use Genesis one um, this morning and um, I'm not going to read all the scripture, but it says in Genesis 1, 3, 6, 9, 11, 14, 20, 24. It's very exhaustive, but it says, then God said, all, everything he created, he said, he said, let there be light. He said, let the water under the sky, meaning the sky. He said, let the earth bring forth grass and seed bearing tree. Everything that he created, he spoke. And I just don't want you to think that I have anything up my sleeve. If you look up the word in the Hebrew, um, just got to say this, anytime you want to understand the word of God, you have to do word study. It's impossible without it. Just absolutely impossible. Because when, when the Bible says like he blots out our transgressions, it sounds like he's dabbing, but the word blot in the Hebrew means to exterminate, annihilate, and obliterate. And that sounds a lot more strong. So you gotta look up the words. Old Testament, Hebrew, it's written in Hebrew, so you need a Hebrew lexicon, New Testament, Greek, and you Greek. It's impossible to really understand the word of God without doing a word study. Just absolutely impossible. So I just want you to see that said means said. The reason why it says to even say in one's heart, because even when you speak something, not with your mouth, you know, God knows. God knows. You don't, you know, you don't, have, to, you don't have to audibly say it to speak it and feel it, because out of the mouth only speaks from the overflow of the heart anyway. So God is so powerful that all he has to do is think it, and, and it comes to being. So... This is kind of scientific and a little boring, but it's called sound energy. It, it's legitimate. It's, it's energy produced by vibration. They travel through a medium like air or water, like I'm speaking right now, it's traveling, and it causes compression, and that's mechanical energy. It's mechanical energy. The Lord, though, when he made you and I, it was totally different. Everything he made up to now, right before he created us, he just spoke. But look at the game changer in 2-7 of, of uh, Genesis. It says, then God, after everything was made, and we were the crown of his creation, by the way. We, we, he saved the best for last. The last shall be first. He made everything for us. Like, I'm making all this for you. There's food, and, and, and there's, there's beauty. It's magnificent. And every, I'm doing it all for you, kids. I'm just giving you the best. And, and it really is. You know, my grandmother used to say in Yiddish, the world is a beautiful place. It's the people that make it ugly. The world's beautiful. I've been all over the world, it's beautiful. So then he says, but then when it came to creating us, all of a sudden, it, it, it just took a turn. And he says, he formed the person from the dust of the ground and breathed into him. Nothing else he formed. Nothing else he breathed into. So, so look, at, look at the words, formed in the Hebrew. It means to form, to, to frame, to shape. And the actual word means like a potter master. And I shared with people this morning, I, I, you know, I went to see a potter master. I wanted to see, and, and all I saw was them constantly caressing the clay. They never, no matter how fast the wheel spun, they never took their hands off the clay. And if God is creating like a potter master, and clearly Isaiah and many other references says that we're the clay, could it be that he never takes his hand off us? I mean, could you even believe that? When many times I'm sure he's saying, where are you, God? He hasn't gone nowhere. And not only this, but I, I, this morning as I was praying at 2.20 in the morning, 
um, the Lord reminded me of something that he showed me many, many, many years ago. I just, I, I had this desire to be perfect because I'm a recovering perfectionist. And in the spirit I want to be, I believed that you could be perfect. The Lord said, be perfect as I am perfect, right? Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount, the only sermon. So I'm thinking, okay. He said it, I'm believing it. So I really tried to be spiritually perfect. In other words, where I wouldn't sin. I know you're thinking that's crazy. Listen, I am so obsessive. You have no idea how obsessive I am. None. But I'm here to tell you that I really tried. And it was very frustrating. There was sometimes I did. I felt so holy and then fall. So one day I just came to the conclusion that although I'll keep trying, although I'll go through the sanctification process, although I'll go through the beautification on the inside out, I realize that I'm going to fall short. I'm going to fall short. And I felt cracked. I felt like I had all these cracks in me and I was leaking. And so I was praying and the Lord showed me. I'm, I don't know if my eyes were open, closed. I don't fully understand visions, but I saw myself going into a room and there was a big potter's wheel and I imagined the Lord was there and he invited me up. He didn't say anything, but he invited me up on the wheel and I went up and I got to tell you, feeling his hands on me was amazing. It was, it was just bliss. And he started to fix my cracks. And once I was fully fixed, it was time to come off the wheel. And I walked away from that room with my back to the wheel. And I felt great. I felt whole. You know what I mean? I felt cleansed. And I felt perfect. I kind of felt perfect. But then it hit me as I was walking away. And I thought, golly, I'm not going to be able to maintain this. This is so hard. How am I going to do this? I'm just going to get cracked again. I know it. And I turned around like saying, I, I quit. And he just looked at me because, of course, God knows our thoughts. He's omniscient. He knows our heart. He knows what we're thinking. You know, sometimes when you've been with somebody 50 years, you don't have to speak. You know what they're thinking. And he knew what I was thinking, obviously. And all he said to me was, I'll be here 24-7. Anytime you need me. You know how freeing that was to know that I'm going to try. I'm going to give it all I got. I'm, I'm never going to be just lackadaisical. I'm just not going to do that. That's not my personality. But I'm still going to mess up. And to know that I can go into that room and get fixed over and over. I mean, if that's not mercy, if that's not love. Guys, where do you get that from in the world? Who do you get that from? I... I Help me out. Who? I mean, somebody will say, you know, I'll forgive you, I'll forgive you, but man, you know, you do that one more time. God has never said, man, you do that one more time. And I'm here to tell you, forgive me for, for putting this out there, but you be careful if you lack mercy, because when you need it, God's going to lack it. You cannot look at the world through the eyes of the law and ask God to look at you through the eyes of grace. It's crazy how quick we are on the trigger, how quick we are to judge, how quick we are to be critical. And then we go, oh God, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And who are they? Be, be just, just be careful. Um, so he shapes, he's touching, and then he says he breathes into us. I was a lifeguard for a long time. I mean, you've got to give people mouth to mouth. This, is God giving us mouth to mouth? Is his lips touching ours? Is this the vision we get? We get this vision that God's holding us and caressing us and touching us. Why didn't he do that with any other part of creation? Even the animals, at least. Why, why don't you touch them? Same reason probably I don't touch them, but that's beside the point. The point I'm making is, do, do you see how, even though it's so much more intimate, it's no less powerful? Why didn't he breathe life into them? We, we are on a different plane, totally a different plane. Genesis 1.26 this is, this is interesting for a lot of reasons. Theologically, it's very interesting, and, and you can argue this all day long, but that's not what I want to do. Then God said, let us. Now, God, Elohim, is singular. Us, obviously, is plural. Who's the us? Some people say, well, obviously, it's Jesus. Jesus was birthed 2,000 years ago. He wasn't birthed 4,000 years ago. The man. God is a plurality, a unified plurality. Elohim is a, is a singular unity, if you will. God is one. There's only one God. But he can manifest himself, right? Did he manifest himself as the angel of the Lord? 
as the commander of the Lord's army in the burning bush, in the cloud, in the pillar? I mean, was he, was he the angel that Abraham bowed down to and worshipped in Genesis 18 or no? God is very complex. God can do anything. But who is he conferring with? If he's just one and Jesus isn't even birthed incarnate yet, of course the word was always there, but the man wasn't there yet, who is he talking to? And in the original Hebrew, if you can grab it, it's, it's Vayome Elohim Na'aseh B'Tzalmenu. Let us is, is, it's okay, one day you'll learn Hebrew because chances are Jesus might talk it. <laughs> but anyway, what, what it is is shall we. That's what it means. Isaiah 6, 2, shall we. So God is saying, shall we? He's conferring with himself, do I want to do this? Back in the day, I'm 60, some of you are older, some of you are younger. Back in the day, kids, believe it or not, you used to go to a dance and walk up to somebody and say, shall we? And the young lady would say, yes, and extend her hand or no thank you. Now I understand, you just, you just kind of jump on somebody on the dance floor. There's no shall we, you're gonna dance with me. You know, what, who are, get away, in my space. But God is conferring with himself and saying, shall, do I want to? And he's letting us know, of course, the, he, of course this plan of salvation was before the foundation of the earth. He wants us to know he's not reacting to the fall of man. He knows what he's going to have to do, but it was put in place in eternity's past. There's no time with God. We're on a time frame, but there's no time. There's eternity's past and eternity's future. By the way, isn't it crazy to go against the will of God for 70 years and miss out on you can't extrapolate, you can't quantify eternity. The best you could do is like a day is like a thousand years and you put it in some or algorithm, if you will, and you'll find out that if the average person lives to be 76, and that's what the insurance table says, so some of you are past that, you're not on borrowed time, I'm not, I'm not prophesying here, I'm just saying that's the average, then our lifespan on an eternal scale is an hour and a half. An hour and a half. That's the best I can do to quantify it. You're going you're gonna to hold on to an hour and a half and give up forever? This is insanity. This is absolutely crazy. But this is a preemptive strike. This is a preemptive strike. God set this up before the foundation of the world. That's how much we're loved. We say, no, no, it, it, it can't be. It, it costs too much. God is trying to communicate to us, I think you're worth it. See, the cross is an unbelievable thing. It sends two big messages. One message says, and make no mistake, sin is awful. Every problem in the world is due to sin. Every problem in a relationship is due to sin. Sin. Sin is the problem. Jesus is the answer. Because when you see it, when you really understand the cross, you realize, I just got to stop sinning. This is, I'm killing people. I'm killing myself. I'm killing my family. I'm killing people. I'm doing to them what they did to Jesus because he took the sins of the world on him, right? But the other message is when you're down on the ground saying sin is awful, get up. I've got something so much better for you. Do you have any idea how valuable you are to me? Do you have any idea of your redemptive value? It sends a beautiful dichotomy of a message. This is what God's saying. You're worth it to me. Next, he says, I'm going to make you in my image. Nothing else was made in his image. Nothing was made in his likeness, right? Nothing is like him except us. Yeah. Likeness similar to a resembling, and then image from Genesis 1.27. Look what it says. So God created humankind, not only his likeness, but his image. And the image is zelem. It's a word, of course, in Hebrew again. And it means likeness or resemblance. Same thing. So, Rabbi, what? Are you a schizophrenic? No, I'm just playing around. What are you saying by this? Are you, are you saying what I think you're saying? Um, I don't know. What do you think I'm saying? We're made in God's image. We are his representation. Make no mistake, nothing else represents him like we do. We're made in his image. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, what was he saying? We should be, I promise you, we should be saying the same thing. If you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. Jesus has left the building, guys. I know people say he lives in my heart, but the last time I checked, he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. 
He has left the building. We could sing all day long. I want to be his hands. I want to be his feet. Nice song, but do we? You know, when I first met the Lord and I was overwhelmed by his love and his mercy and his kindness, I was overwhelmed by this intimacy. I, I didn't go to church. I didn't even know you were supposed to. I just spent time in his presence constantly. Couldn't get away from it. I couldn't get my mind off him. And one day I just said, you're so good. I don't understand why people just don't believe in you. What, what is it? And I heard him say, bad representation. I know we're not perfect, and I know we fall short of the glory of God, but some of you are a little too obvious. I mean, you can't walk around like, all I know is I got Jesus in my heart. He sounds angry. It's just, it's just a lousy way. I know you have bad days, but you're, all, you're entitled to say to somebody, look, I'm having a really rough time of it. I just got some really bad news, and I'm not really good to be around people. I'm so sorry. Or when you blow it, go to the person. Go to the person. It doesn't matter where it is. Go back and say, hey, man, there's no way I was showing you the way Jesus is. And I'm sorry. Just be honest and open, but be real and be genuine. But we are the light of the world. This is all he's got. Look around. You're it. And we're supposed to represent him. We're supposed to show him the way he would want us to show him. We have to be merciful, we have to be kind, and we just have to really care about people and show them the love of God. I don't tell my wife I love her, I do, but who cares? I, I show her. I don't tell my friends, hey, I love you, man. I don't, I don't even want to hear, show me. I want to feel it, I want to experience it, I want to see it, I want it to be legitimate. So we're called to resemble God, and we are like very unique. I mean, we have this unique relationship that no other creation has. We have an intellect. Animals don't. How many animal lovers are there? There's a lady in my congregation. She's such a lunatic about animals, really. She really thinks they talk to her. Um, I try to tell her, listen, um, David Berkowitz thought his dog talked to him, and he ended up being the 44 caliber killer, so watch yourself when it comes to that kind of thing. We have an intellect. We have a moral nature. We have morality. Look, if we're made in his likeness, I'll give you an example. The first time I did prison ministry, like 29 years ago, now we, we have CDs and DVDs going to prisons all over the country, all over the world. But the first time, I didn't know what I was doing, not that I know so much now. But I remember sitting with a guy and saying, like, what are you in for? I didn't know you're not supposed to do that. I just didn't know. And he said, I killed my wife. I said, wow. He said, a very matter of fact, for, for burning a stake. You watch out, you guys. Be careful who you marry. Um, but I said, he didn't have remorse. But I said to him, how do you feel about um, a pedophile? And he got really angry, and he said, he comes in here, I'll kill him. Where did he get, he had some level of consciousness of sin. Where did he get it from? You know, our hearts can get hard. We can actually walk in sin and walk in it so much that it's not so bad because instead of us comparing ourselves to Jesus Christ, we compare ourselves to Jack the Ripper and we look pretty good. But that's not all comparison, right? So what I'm saying is we're made in his likeness. We have a moral nature. We have the power to communicate. I mean, I know Lassie had the power, but I never understood what she was really saying. <laughs> oh, he's in the well. How does anybody know that? We have the power to communicate. And we have an emotional nature that transcends all instinct. Look, I'm not talking about physical likeness. I don't, I don't know if you realize, but Chuck and I, we are, I should say Pastor Chuck, forgive me, we are um, really great friends. I mean, I would have to say uh, my good friends, I can count on just a few fingers, and he's one of the fingers. It happened supernaturally. Um, it's, he's, he's a wonderful guy to be around. I'm, I'm very crazy, and I'm very nuts. I'm crazy, and, um, and he's not. He's not. I feel, like, I feel like my life is like the Shawshank Redemption, and he's Morgan Freeman, the black guy that, you know, simmers me down. So I, I love talking to him. We, we talk either text, well, I do. I text or I email or call him probably four or five times a week. That's crazy, right? 
that's nuts, but, but we, we just, I stay in contact with him. But look at how different we are. He was raised in the deep south. You know what I mean? I was raised in the projects of New York City. My dad was a gangster. His dad was a pastor. I grew up in the projects doing stuff at 10 and 11 and 12 that no, it ripped me off of my innocence. You know, he got married so he can have intercourse. I mean, that's what you do back then. Oh, you're not supposed to say that? Like, the, everybody thinks the stalk wrote them? Sorry. Okay, he got married for intimacy. Um, totally different backgrounds, totally different cultures, but it's not about physical characteristics when you're in the Lord. Everybody has that blood type J. You know what I'm talking about? And I can go to Africa, I can go to India. Severely different cultures. I mean, Macon. <laughs> um, no. One time I spoke somewhere and I told them that I was moving to Macon and the guy said, you're going out of the country. But anyway, <laughs> even though we have different cultures, when you're a believer, if you're really born again, do you realize you're the same? You have the same God, you have the same Savior, you have the same scriptures, you have the same spirit, one faith, one baptism, one, 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 and even though you might have some different idiosyncrasies and some quirks, we're all different. You realize how quirky you are? Do you ever think about it? There's no two snowflakes alike. In a snowstorm, there's trillions of snowflakes. Not two are alike. Identical twins. Same egg split. Identical. Exactly identical DNA. Fingerprints are different. You're different. Some of you are really different. But you're different. But when it comes to believers, we have total fellowship. This is what we talk about. We don't talk about how's that. Who cares? What's the Lord telling you? What's going on with the Lord? What's the Lord saying? And, and it's, just, it's just wonderful to be around a brother in Messiah. That's the way I kind of look at it. I also want you to see two last points, if you will, just in Genesis. And um, we're going to have, I'm going to have a lot of fun tonight. I'm just going to have a lot of fun because Genesis 2 is where a woman came on the scene. And uh, there's a lot to be said about that. We're going to ha just have a lot of fun. You realize, I, I hope you realize, not just physically, men and women are totally different. Have you realized that? Um, let, me, let me give you an example. See how this works. I'm just going to test the waters here. I'm going to throw this out there. If you don't like it, just throw it back. What's the difference between a boyfriend and a husband? 30 pounds. What's the difference between a girlfriend and a wife? 30 pounds. You see how little laughter there was? <laughs> Guys, I just proved it to you. It's the exact same joke. The women and the men laughed at the first joke, and some of the brave men were, laughed at the second joke. I saw some of you. You looked over and like, Can I, is it all right at the laugh? I'm, just a chuckle? So I really recommend you come out because you're going to learn something about marriage that I guarantee you never saw in the Bible. Never, ever, and it's going to be very freeing for a lot of you, especially the women. The other thing I want you to see, Genesis 1.20, it says, God bless them, be fruitful and multiply. Obviously, just as a side note, just in case you're wondering, only heterosexuals can fulfill that command. I was speaking to a young lady who was lesbian the other day. She knows me. She works at a restaurant. And she said, look, we can have a family. You know, we're going to adopt, me and my wife. And I said, you couldn't adopt if they weren't heterosexuals. Just something to think about. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth, have control over it. Obviously, the earth is out of control because man is out of control. Man has gotten so greedy. It's just crazy. It's like the lawyer gets his tax return filled out, so the accountant rips him off. So then he's got to rip off the plumber. The plumber then has to rip off the lady. The lady has to, it's crazy. Do you see how expensive things are? Everybody just wants more and more and more. And that's why the world is out of control. It's not the world's fault. But what I want you to focus on is the fact that as soon as God created man, the very first act he did was to bless them. Right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, he said, and man was created, and God blessed them. Like, right after, like God lays hands on him and blesses them. Does God really want to bless us? 
If he loves us, he does. When you love somebody, what do you want to do? You want to bless them. You want to make them happy, right? And they say, thank you so much, but you're so happy to make them happy. Whether it's your kids, your spouse, a buddy, uh, the, the, the kids that need wheelchairs, it doesn't matter. They go, thank you so much. You're like, no, no, I, I, I really want to do this. You don't have to. No, no, I know. I really want to do this. I want to bless you because blessing comes from love. When you love somebody, you bless them. Now, the word baruch, it's well known in Jewish circles. It's even well known in Christian circles. To kneel or to salute, like you would do to an officer. But obviously, God is not kneeling before man and saluting them. That just would go against who he is. But there's another definition for the same word baruch, and it means to adore. Does God, did, does God adore us? I'll tell you, I have four kids. I, that doesn't seem like a lot, but it's kind of a lot, especially with, with you know, we, I just heard from my congregational leader in Australia this morning, he had a question. We have 200 village congregations in India. We have orphanages and, and village congregations in Kenya, all over Kenya. Uh, Israel, a children's home, it's, it's really getting out of control. It's just so much to take care of. And um, I'm trying to juggle it all. And I remember when Jeremy, my 24-year-old, was born. Um, I got to tell you, we had no family, no friends. Um, and I remember when he came out of the womb, um, first of all, he looked exactly like Violet Beauregard from Willy Wonka because the umbilical cord was around his neck three times and he was just like a blueberry. I was like, I, you know, I didn't know whether I wanted to eat him or hold him. I, I was very confused, but I fell in love with him that moment. Now, he could do nothing for me. But I haven't loved him any more than at that very moment. Do you really think that when you do good things by God, acts of righteousness, he loves you more? And when you do bad things, he loves you less? Because that's not what the Bible says. It's just not what it says. In fact, when Jeremy was born, something opened up. I was always a loving guy, but something opened up in my heart that I didn't even know was there. I couldn't explain it, but he was mine. Like, me and Bernadette became one in our children. Even though you're trying to become one spiritually, you're distinctly different. You're really different individuals, but you become one in your children. There's something about them that causes you, like they're a piece of you, they're a piece of your wife, and it's, it's beautiful. That's how I believe God feels about us. I believe he fell in love with us from day one, and he hasn't stopped loving us. So the first thing he does is bless us. The very last thing Jesus does when he leaves, right, right before he's ready to leave, it's like, I got to go. It's time to go. I got to go back to my father. But before I go, let me bless you. Look. Luke 24, I think 50, 51. It says he leads them out towards Bethania, Bethany, which is just about three miles east on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. He's going to raise, which he's going to come. Listen, if you want to know about his second coming, get a camcorder. If Peter had a camcorder and he reversed it, his second coming is going to be the reverse of his first going. He's going to come right back down to that spot of the Mount of Olives, check Zechariah 14. It says he led them out towards Bethany. He's ready to ascend because before I ascend, what can I, what's the best thing I could do for you? The very last thing. And so he says, come here. And he lays hands on them because to bless somebody is a very loving act. And I'm, I might be spitballing here and you say, nobody knows you're right. Nobody knows the blessing. But if I, ha if I was a betting man, I would absolutely have to say it has to come from number 6, 24, 26. And why do I say that? Because that blessing is the only blessing that ever came from the mouth of God. God sat with Moses, and he said, Moses, because this was his intercessor, if you will, he said, uh, the mediator, he said, I want you to tell your brother, Aaron. Who was Aaron? He was the high priest. He was the priest, the conduit between the people, God's children, and God. The children of Israel, if you will, and God. He was the go-between. And he was the guardian of the gates of glory, and he was to bless the people. And God told Moses specifically, this is the way I want Aaron to bless my children. God's spirit, but if he came down in physical form, that's the blessing. I have taught people to say this blessing over their kids every night. My kid, when he's home, 24 years old, he's, I'm telling you, this kid is strapping. He'll get on his knees and say, Dad, bless me. We bless them every night this way. I don't want to come up with some newfangled blessing. What's a better blessing than the words out of God's mouth? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Think about it. Three sentences. What are you saying over your children? I want you to protect them. 
Does any parent not want their kids to be protected? I want my kids to prosper. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, prosperity. And I want my kids to have peace. Think about it. What more do you want than protection, prosperity, and peace? It's the fullness of blessing. And then he says, when you say it, nobody talks to you about verse 27, but I will put my name on them, meaning I will be blessing them. And he's the high priest. So what do you think the great high priest would say? What better could he say over his disciples than the Lord bless you? Are they not one? Is Yeshua and the Father not one? So if God would say this, Yeshua, God in the flesh, wouldn't he say it? What a beautiful thing to say over you people. The very first thing God does is bless. The very last thing Yeshua does is bless. And the Bible ends on a blessing. This is a book filled with divine judgment. The blood is up to the horse's bridle. How could this book that's so divinely judgmental and fiery and bloody, and it ends on a blessing, may the grace of the Lord be with you all, not universal salvation, but all the saints, it's implied, because he's speaking to the seven churches. This is, this is to me, is what God is all about. He wants to bless us, but we have to position ourselves for blessing. God just doesn't haphazardly bless this one and not bless that one. There's blessings for obedience, and there's curses for disobedience, and that will never change. That didn't change when Jesus came along. That hasn't changed since he's left. There are blessings for obedience, just like you teach your kids, work hard. You work hard and you'll prosper. Put in the effort. You know, some of us, like, we get these kids on, on the ball field, they don't have a shot, a snowball's chance to make it, but we're vicariously living through them, and we want them to work so hard on the ball field, right, so they can win that trophy. Shouldn't we want that for ourselves as far as how we work with the Lord and how we walk in righteousness and to position ourselves to be blessed? To, 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 to just pull the blessing right out of God? Not to prosper, but just to be close to the Lord. And, and last but not least, look at the last few scriptures. In Genesis 1, there's a ton of them. I'm not going to read them all, but everything he made, you'll see if you look at these scriptures, he said it was good. Everything he made, guys, he said it was good. Now, I've heard this term thrown around so much. Hey, how was the movie? It was good. Which, which could mean it was horrible, but. Um, how, was, how was dinner last night? It's good. How's your vacation? It's good. But in, in the Bible, good doesn't mean that. You know, look at what it means. These are just four of the definitions. There's others, splendid, magnificent, praiseworthy, worthy of praise. Beautiful? He, God said that everything he made was beautiful, and it really was. I mean, everything was great till Genesis 3. That's where we came along. Everything up to then, right? Genesis 1, 2 was perfect, right? No sin, no sorrow, no sadness, and guess what? Revelation 21, 22, it comes back to beautiful. First two chapters are beautiful. The last two chapters are beautiful. It's a great end, right? Beautiful, delightful, pleasing, and excellent. Now, since I live in the South, I have had my fair share of fried chicken and potato salad. And I can tell you that I've had a lot of really good potato salad, but I can tell you that it was beautiful, delightful, pleasing, and excellent. When God speaks about his creation, that's what he said. He said it's beautiful, delightful, pleasing, and excellent. Now look at the next couple of scriptures. It says, now God's making man. He finished making everything else. And he says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good what's going on what's the, there's a distinction right everything he made was beautiful and delightful but when he made us it was beautiful on steroids look very good mayod tob in the hebrew especially beautiful especially delightful can you imagine if we really saw ourselves the way god sees ourselves because if we did, we might just see other people the way God sees them too. It'd be the cure-all. I mean, look, the, the badge of a Christian is not coming to church. It's, it's not uh, putting a fish on the back of your car. It's not a cross on the lapel. It's not a T-shirt with, with Jesus on the cross saying bench press this. It's not. It's not Bible study. It's not. It's how you love one another. That is the telltale sign. 
And the scriptures that you guys read just before we started in, in John 15, it says, love each other the way I love you. So when you're unloving, you're saying, well, I guess Jesus is unloving to me. It's a, it's a bad deal. Nobody's perfect, but I think, I think we want to get into the depths. I used to teach the depths of the book of Revelation. And I used to teach a lot about enigmas. And people are hungry today. They're knowledge hungry. Give me more knowledge. I'm like, I'll give you all the knowledge you want. I can spin your head with Hebrew and Greek. Will that help you love each other? If you know where the Ark of the Covenant is, will that help you love each other? If you know when Jesus was coming back, would that help you love each other? The fact is, we don't want to do what's simple because that's what we struggle with most. And that's what God wants for us most. Look, um, this was just a, a kind of foundation. I just wanted to show you just in the first chapter that God's love is all over the place, right out of the gate. First chapter in the Bible. We'll, we'll get into the second chapter tonight. It's just a lot of fun, but the third chapter Monday is unbelievable when, when we see the fall and we see what God did. And I'll show you something that I never saw until I prepared for this. And for me, it was like, it just, it just knocked me out. It pinned me. And the Lord was like, do you see it now? Do you see how much I love you? And I said, I do, Father. I know it's very easy to say, Lord, I'm so unworthy because I feel like this all the time. But then sometimes I'll hear God say, not to me or not. You know, you could, you could have a um, relationship with God. It says, my little children, I want you not to sin, which means once you're born again, he's always your father. I have four kids. I'll never not be their father. Biologically, I won't be their father, correct? I'm always going to be their father. Nobody can deny that, but you can lose fellowship. If I send my kids to the room, that's still my son. I'm still their father, and, but we are out of fellowship, and that's where the pain is. I'm in pain when I'm out of fellowship with my kids. They're in pain when they're out of fellowship with their dad. It's the same thing with you. You can be born again, very saved, but at the same time be hurting and miserable because you're out of fellowship, and it happens so easy. Guys, it happens so easy. I can see the Lord at the foot of my bed. Not one morning do I go anywhere without spending time with him. Not one. I don't want to have him say, maybe tomorrow, as I pass by him at the foot of the bed. I've been waiting all night for you to wake up. Kid, can we spend some time? Not now, Dad. You know, the cat's in the cradle in the verse. Not now. I, I got things to do. I, I got to check. I got to check my Facebook account. I got to grab the coffee. I got to run. I got things to do. Maybe tomorrow. And then tomorrow becomes next week and next month. And some of you might not have had intimate fellowship with God in a year. I'm telling you, it's a killer. It's an absolute killer. Where it starts is being born again. You've got to be connected. All I know is one thing. I don't know why, but God said, bring your bathing suit on the trip. So if you have never been born again, I'm at the Holiday Inn. I will, I will dunk you right after this service. I will not wait till three months or three years. You, we will pray. You will say, Father, I want that. I want what this guy's talking about. And I guess I got to test the waters and see if it's legit. So I'm sorry for all the things I've done wrong. I believe you can forgive me for those things. I want to do the right thing. I want your power. I want your help. I want to know I can go to you when I mess up. I want to know that I have forgiveness for the rest of my life. I want to have eternal life, and I believe it's through Yeshua's sacrifice. And you do that, and I will dunk you in that pool, and maybe even buy you lunch. So you just got to just gotta see me afterward. But with that being said, you have so much value. You are so loved. You just have no idea. Please um, come hang out with us tonight and Monday, and let's see if we can't drive this point home to you like, okay, I get it, Rabbi Greg. Thanks for having me. See you tonight.